There we go. <laughs> okay. So it's now recording. Um, so was that a Chinese person going back to China? So you'd be monitored now forever? I don't know. I think what we're going to do here is we'll spotlight me so you can see what's going on. And I'll adjust things so you can see. So what we're going to tie here is what's called a tarpon toad. It's uh, basically a tarpon fly. Uh, not that a lot of you are going to go tarpon fishing, but I know Tony is. Um, I caught uh, a pretty decent sized tarpon on one of these things in purple. Uh, so it's worth, if you're going to saltwater fish, it's worth having some of these in your box. That said, um, for those of us around here, that's a pretty big fly. But what I did do is I tied them on a smaller hook. This is a four aught hook. I tied them on a smaller hook. This is a one aught. You could probably tie them down to a size two. Um, and I'm thinking that would make a pretty decent bass fly. So if you want to go fishing bass around here, I, I would maybe want to give something like that a try. So it, it might make it possible to do. There are a couple of tricks with this guy that would be applicable to other kinds of flies. And the first one is if you're tying bunny leeches, it's this at the back here, that's a uh, piece of monofilament tied in a loop and that holds the bunny tail up so that it doesn't get wrapped around your hook. So that's the first trick. The hook I'm using today is, is a four aught because tarpon are big fish and they, uh, they also have very hard mouths. So you need something with some leverage to get that hook to go in. Um, and it's a short shank hook, relatively short shank hook. This is a Gamakatsu, uh, Gamakatsu X1 short. Now the thread I'm going to use for this is we're going to tie them in the gaudy colors that will work for tarpon and for, for pike. So I'm using a uh, nice uh, chartreuse thread. I'm going to start that just behind the eye of the hook. And then I'm going to cover the hook shank with thread. And, and again, back to beginners, one of the tricks I use, and I don't know how well this shows up on here. Let's see if I can put it up. No, it's not going to help. Um, the light colored thread doesn't look okay against that shirt. I hold the hook, this, the thread up at about a 45 degree angle. And as I wrap the thread down the hook shank, I let it hit the thread I'm holding up and that tends to push the wraps together. So they don't end up looking kind of awkward all the way down the shank of the hook. When I get down to where the point is, then I will trim off the tag of the thread. And I will go past the point right to the start of the bend. That's where I'm going to stick my rabbit strip in. Now, the rabbit strip I'm using today is a two toned rabbit strip, black and chartreuse. And I'm going to take a piece off the these guys have a nap. So there's one end is the trailing end and one end is the, the lead end. So I'm gonna take it off the trailing end where the fur goes to the back. And I'm going to measure that. I don't want a really long gravit strip. So I'm gonna measure it for just a little past shank length. And at that point, I'm gonna hold the rabbit fur in my left hand like that. I'm going to take my bodkin and get in here and make sure I get the, the fur out of the way right down to the, to the leather part of the rabbit strip. And at that point, now that I've got them separated, I'm going to lay that down on the hook shank at a bit of an angle. And I'm going to wrap the first wrap right in that gap and, and, then, and hold it right on the hook shank. And then I'm gonna make one more wrap in there to hold it down. 
Then I'm gonna pull the rabbit strip back, make a couple of wraps in front. And then I'm gonna get in here with my scissors and I'm going to trim it off tight the shank. And then to make sure that's not going anywhere, I'm gonna wrap over top of that little bit of stub of rabbit fur or rabbit leather and leave it there. The next thing I'm gonna do is turn it upside down in my rotary vise and get my thread right back to where I've got the, the rabbit fur attached. So right at the back here. I'm gonna take my monofilament and this is uh, some saltwater mono. This one is 26 pound. You could probably get by with 20. More importantly, it's 0 0.023. So it's a fairly, fairly stiff mono. I'm gonna cut, cut a piece off. And I'm gonna lay it diagonally across the back of the hook on the underside, right where my thread is tied. And I'm gonna go over top. Let's take a take the kink out of that. Um, lay it over top and tie it right there at that angle across the hook, a bit of an angle, two or three or four wraps. And you can see now that if you can if you can see here, there's a the the nylon is going diagonally across the hook shank. I'm gonna take and make a loop behind the bend of the hook. And I'm gonna take that other tag end and lay that across the shank at that angle and make several wraps over that to hold that in place. So now you, you see I've got a loop sitting there. And then I'm gonna wrap forward a bit to tie the tag of both of those pieces of nylon right down to the shank of the hook. When I got them nice and secured, I'm gonna get my scissors in here and trim the butt, pull the mono out, trim the butt ends at pretty much as tight as I can get. Right down, tight. Secure the last little bits of the butt ends that are sitting there. Now I'm going to come to the back, right to the back again. Now you can see what happened there is I, now I've got this loop of mono here that is going to support the leather part of the rabbit strip and keep it from sagging down below the hook shank. So now we want a little bit of contrasting colors in here. What I'm going to use is some yellow marabou. And with the yellow marabou, what I'm gonna do is just, I'm gonna pull a little bit off the stem here at the bottom. It's fairly long. I'm just gonna pull a chunk like that. And I only want, I don't want that to go more than uh, where the, just shy of the length of the rabbit fur. I'm just going to hold it right on top of the hook and do a loose wrap and give it a good snug, pull the front end up, lock it in, and trim it clean. I'm going to do the same thing on the underside. And this stuff is on the one side of this mirror, but it happens to be a little shorter. So I'm going to take the shorter stuff. And I'm going to do the same thing. And this time I'm going to kind of get it on both sides of the hook shank. Strip it on both sides of the hook shank and lay it down on top, on, on the underside of the hook. And wrap that in on the underside. And now I've got a little bit of contrasting color against that rabbit strip tail. I just want a little more bulk at the back of this fly and something that's going to slim down when you strip it. So I have some chartreuse marabou. 
And with this one, I'm going to strip the hackle clear and I'm just going to use the plume, the end of it. I'm going to stroke it back a bit to expose the stem. And then I'm going to lay the stem down on the, on the hook, right where my thread is hanging there in front of the yellow marabou. And I'm going to tie in that V where the tip is pointing forward and the stem is pointing backwards. I'm going to pull this back, wrap in front, and then I'm going to trim the the stem, the tip out. Keep my thread well back. And then I'm going to do this like a wet fly. I'm going to strip, strip, uh, fold this marabou hackle so that the plumes go to the back. And I'm going to wrap that around the shank of the hook. All I'm doing is building a little fluffy bulge at the back of the hook shank. And again, now that I've got that all there, pull the marabou out of the way, and then wrap in front to lock it in and trim the stem out. Blow it all back so that it makes a nice, smooth cone shape in front. So from here on out, we're going to make this front part of the fly using a different material that's, that's synthetic. Um, and in order to keep all this stuff out of the way, now what we're going to do is we're going to be tying this synthetic material crosswise, directly crosswise at 90 degrees to the hook shank. And we're going to be tying it on in little clumps. And the material is this stuff, it's called EP fiber. And it's, it's nice and fluffy, it's fairly soft material. Uh, you can get in gazillion colors. It's, this EP fiber is expensive, but you don't use a lot for any individual fly. And it's better than this fish hair for this type of fly. The fish hair is quite coarse and stiff, and it tends to make a head that is not fuzzy. It's, it's very stiff and, uh, and bristly, whereas the EP fiber is going to make a very fuzzy head. So it might be a little more expensive, but the EP fiber is much preferable for this kind of flat. And I'm going to take out a chunk here. Uh, that's a good size. And I'm going to use probably half of this for the fly. So in order to make this possible to do, one of the problems you're going to have when you're trying to tie this material at right angles to the hook shank is you're going to wrap over it diagonally one way, underneath over diagonally the other way, and then you're going to repeat that. Now, the problem is if you're doing that without controlling this material at the back of the hook, is you're going to have devil of a time making those wraps. So the secret tool is this paper clip. It's, it's kind of hollow-ish. But what is really nice is I can slide this paper clip down the hook shank and a bit of an angle here. And it will, if I do it right, it will hold, ah, got some fibers in there. It will hold all this material out of the way while I'm doing the next set. That's the inexpensive version of the of Petit Jean uh, yep. lamp. Yep, very similar. It works great. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a small batch of this EP fiber off of that. And I don't need a whole lot in, in each of these. I'm going to lay probably about five 
four or five of these batches of EP fiber crosswise on the hook. And it doesn't need to be too wide. Uh, so I'm gonna take it so that it's about a little more than shank width, shank length. I'm gonna do it in small bunches. So I'm going to hold this fiber across the hook at a slight angle. I'm going to take from the front to the back at across that fiber. Then I'm going to hold the near side out of the way. And I'm going to go from the back to the front. So I'm going in in front of. Now that, after that first wrap, I'm going to just adjust them so I've got equal amounts of fiber on either side of the hook. And then I'm going to go in back and in front again. So underneath the hook, diagonally back over top, underneath and over top in front. And I'm going to do this four or five times and increasing the tension as I do so that it makes that material stick straight out to the side. Now, as you can imagine, I'm going to bring my thread in front and I'm going to make another batch and do exactly the same thing. But if I try to do that with this fuzzy fiber, it's going to be in the way. So my really expensive tool, I slide that down the hook shank and that holds that stuff out of the way. See how it's going to be nice and clean in here now for me to do my next set. And I have enough here to do a couple. So, and again, the amount that I'm using is not not a whole pile, just a small. Hey, yeah. what exactly is that material? It's called EP fiber, and I don't know what it is specifically. It's a it's a synthetic uh, polypropylene or something like that, but it's not stiff. It's very very soft. A package of that stuff is expensive. It's like 16 bucks for a package. But one package will do you a lifetime of flies for this purpose. So there's the second one. Again, take my clip out of the way. Stroke all that stuff back. You can get a job hairdressing. <laughs> yeah. And then that's like putting foils in. <laughs> And then I got another another chunk of that this stuff. Okay, right there. And this now that now that you can see the, the technique, this will go a little quicker. Ah, come back. Come to Papa. Uh, one of the problems with the, some of these some of these threads is they tend the bobbin tends to spin out of the way on you and untwist the thread and it, then the, the loop doesn't land where you want. So you have to spin the bobbin sort of clockwise underneath. When I get it in position, I will do the next one. And I'm gonna even it out. Now at this point, yeah, I'm starting to get close to the front eye of the hook. So I'm going to put a, a wrapper in front of that last batch. Take this thing out of the way. And I have a thing that I use for when, you, when you're packing deer hair. I have this guy here that has a handle and a bunch of little holes. And you pick the hole that just barely goes over the eye of the hook which is that one. And then I push it down right onto the shank of the hook and I hold the back of this and I'm gonna just compact those things back against each other. So it's nice and tight. And you see now all of a sudden I can get another batch of fiber in there. I'm gonna do that, get another batch of fiber, maybe two if I'm lucky. You end up with little bits of fiber everywhere. But it's kind of like deer hair that way. You end up with bits of stuff every which way. Take my little tool again.
I'm just gonna slide him back. And again, do the diagonal wraps. And I want to get enough to make this fairly secure. So three or four good wraps either way. And I'm going to just ease this back again and see how much room I've got. If I do a skinny batch, I should be able to get one more. So it's, it's a little bit tedious, but I can live with that. So this is the fifth one. Spin the bob on. And then the last little bit. I'm going to pack that back again. And the reason for this last bit of packing is I now have a, put a pair of eyes on the front of this guy. And there they are, mono eyes. I'm in a package. And I do the same thing. I lay this diagonally on the hook shank. I'm not too worried about the fibers at this point because I can work around this eye fairly easily. Again, the same thing, this diagonal from back to front and front to back. Get them good and secure. These eyes might take a, a few more wraps because they tend to grind around the hook shank. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a whip finish around the eye of the hook. Are those eyes plastic or lead? Yep, they're plastic. So I do a whip finish and then we'll do a double whip finish. We will do some gluing in a minute later. But I'll do some trimming first. So now I'm wet finished off, cut the thread. Now comes the fun part, which is taking this stuff and I wanna get the EP fiber forward and all of the, the marabou fiber back. And I'm gonna put my little tool here just to kind of separate the two. because I'm going to trim the EP fiber, but not the marabou. So for this, I'm going to take my scissors and I'm going to put them, and I'll, I'll do this where I can see. I'm going to lay the scissors right up against the eye and I'm going to do it at, cut them at a, here like this. Lay them right up against the eye and I'm going to hold it at a slight angle so that the back of that EP fiber cut is longer than the front. I'm going to trim it off. Didn't quite get them all, but that's okay. And then I'm going to do it the other side, the same way, lay it right up against the eye, cut a bit of an angle. I'm going to trim the loose ends out here. And there we go. You have met bits and pieces of stuff that's in the way. Trim it a little bit. And 
So now you can see I've got that bit of a V shape on both sides and it's kind of flat across the front. And just now that that's done, I can get my tool out of the way. And I'm gonna take my Velcro stick and I'm just gonna very gently pull at this stuff to brush it out a bit. You could probably do that with a toothbrush just as well. Fuzz it up a bit and stroke all of the marabou back and mini mallard stick it out and we're done. So that's him, there's your tarpon toad. That's a cool fly, Dave. Yeah, I just thought it would, you know, cut some interesting techniques and an interesting material. Uh, I think bass would eat that up. I, I think, yeah, tied, tied on a size one hook like that. I think it, it you know, that uses a smaller size eye. And you could probably even go small. This is a size one aught. You could probably go down to a number two. <laughs> I, th I think you're right. I think this would make a terrific bass fly. It's going to create lots of disturbance in the water. So I, I think it, uh, and it, and it's gaudy, which bass like, <laughs> and it floats. So you could cast it in the lily pads. Yeah. And I like, uh, I like the technique about the loop behind the tail to hold you it do up. That on, you could yeah. do that on all your bunny leeches, I think. Yep, right? exactly. So I'll de-spotlight me here. Da, da, da. You could probably even fish it like a streamer in, yep. uh, in a lot of cases. And uh, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you get uh, salmon on it. Your coho, yep. like, it's got all the good colors. It's got mm -hmm. the right colors, yeah, I think so. And, and again, you know, it's got a profile too. So the salmon are gonna see it from underneath as do the tarpon, right? And it's mm -hmm. going to have a little bit of a fatter profile. Mm -hmm. So it, I think it's worth experimenting with anyway. So that was the reason for doing it was, was to, to give uh, Tony a heads up on how to tie the tarpon toad, which I was an effective tarpon fly. And at the same time, uh, come up with something that, that maybe we can adapt for the fish here. Interesting. Now I did tie, like I say, I did tie that other one here with 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 the with this stuff, which is just uh, super hair. But it doesn't; it's not as fuzzy as the EP fiber. Okay. And I have this super hair in a whole variety of colors, so not so much not so much for the uh, tarp and toads because uh, for the bigger ones, the EP fiber is. It's not cheap. I think it's like 16 bucks for a package. Well, so it's not a cheap material, but I have a feeling that this is gonna come in useful for a whole bunch of uh, salmon flies down the road. Now, wherever I put the baggie, I gotta put it in. <laughs> so now Tony is on. Oh gosh, okay. He's gonna do. Oh, by the way, what I what I forgot to conclude in that, you, if you want, you can throw a little flash in with it too. Just before you tie on the last marabou, you can throw a little bit of flash in. So, okay. with it. so gents, I'm going to give it a shot. Don't know how successful it will be, but um, so we're doing a black ghost, a kind of a traditional streamer. It's been around for a long time. So uh, tying it on a um, NATO uh, streamer hook. And the um, only thing I don't like about these is I find these umpquas, the eye has a tiny little gap. You tend to get your, uh, your thread caught in it sometimes. But anyway, so tie on uh, your thread six on at um, just basically where the barb is. And the first thing is pheasant head. So take the crest and pull up two or three feathers on just to give a nice little swept up tail. The tail should 
stick out about from the point of the hook to the eye. Let's tie that in gently, make sure she's sitting nicely. At the same time, before we go anywhere else, we take a nice flat tinsel, um, cut off about, I don't know, three, four inches. And tie in on the opposite side of the hook with the color that you want facing you, which is the silver side at about a 45 degree angle. Oops. So making sure she's nice and seated. Two wraps in front, trim it off. You can tie in a little bit of a bump. Sorry, I'm going to put my glasses on because I can't see so good. My eyesight is pretty poor. It's too loose. Move it on up to the front of the hook <clears throat> to just before the eye. Then next step is get some of this uh, Vivas, nice piece of black. Again, tie in a, a cut off about a, maybe four inches or so. Tie that in at the front. Trim it off. And then wrap all the way down. Trying to keep a nice smooth body. And where you've tied in at the back, you want to stop just before that and then head all the way back up again. So you've got a nice, sorry, even body. So, so Tony, in order to avoid lumping that up, do you find that you have to sort of untwist it every once in a while? Um, I keep it sort of fairly pinched as I'm going. And it doesn't seem to matter if it splays out a bit. Okay, yeah, I think that it helps if it does splay out. And sometimes yeah. I find that I have to untwist the the fiber as I wrap it because it tends to naturally. Right. They have well, to give I, it a little, little half twist to get the untwist out. Yeah, I used to um, put it on the bodkin. Um, and I found that it didn't work very well because it would get all sort of fouled up. As you can see, it's got a nice, even kind of smooth body. Tie that off. Couple in front. Sorry, I got the shakes this morning, guys. Too much coffee. I think it was too much wine last night. With John Pierce. That 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 too. My 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 brother, when he was uh, still 
practicing oral surgery, he, he would not drink coffee or wine because his hands would shake. <laughs> not, not good if you're working on somebody's mouth. No, no. Okay, so now um, we just take our tinsel and a nice rotary vise. Do about four or five wraps nicely evenly spaced. Tie that off. Right, flip her around. So I'm just gonna clean this up a little bit. Then take a yellow cock, strip off all the fluff. And then take about, don't want to take too many, strip off some of the bottom fibers, the longer ones from both sides. So then you've got a nice, I call it like, they call it a hackle, but it's more like a beard. So then take the length should just come almost to the point, strip out any Lengthy ones, sorry. Not too many. So it should begin fairly sparse, just to the point of the hook. Tie that in using Dave's technique. Spinning it so it sits nicely. Fine. Sorry. Couple of wraps in front. I'm not doing a very good job here. I'm just doing a couple of wraps at the front here to sort of block that gap on the hook. Then take a, um, next thing we've got to do is just again, straight uh, cock, hackle. Take one fiber from one side, one fiber from the other side of about equal length. Now you're gonna want it to be almost a hook length past the bend of the hook. So it's gonna go quite far back. Anyway, I prepped a couple of them here in advance, so it don't take too long. So being from either side, you've got a nice, nice curve and you want it to sit a little bit upright towards the back. So you can, if you're, I normally try and tie them, I tie them in one at a time, but I'm gonna give it a shot tying them in both at the same time. Stupid. 
They should be lying right next to each other with face in, dull side in. Two light wraps just so you can get them positioned nicely. No, not sitting nicely. I'm going to do it once, one per side, guys, because I find I tend to end up getting it better. Flip it over, do the same on the opposite. Then you can adjust them. I find pull them back. You can actually, oops, too much. couple of wraps inside and actually wrap over them before trimming. And I guess towards the end, synthetic. Um, can't afford to buy the actual jungle cock eyes. But I think they work pretty effectively. They're just expensive as heck. Okay, so you want that to measure it about coming to the second wrap of your foil or mylar. Tie that in nice and tight as a cheek. Flip her over. Do the same on the other side. And just make sure they're nice and even. Pull them back, couple of wraps in front, trim them off. I like this, I don't want to make it too fat. And when you trim off these synthetic ones, you get this sort of white paper. So I just give it a little bit of a black felt pen. and start to build a nice head. Do a whip finish. Turn that off. And finally, I get this high gloss UV resin. This should be a challenge with my shakes. And spread that out a bit. 
Give it a bit of a zap. And there you have a black ghost. Mm -hmm. Nicely dyed, Tony. I know. <laughs> Shakies. I don't know why I've got the bloody shakes today, but it makes it bloody harder. <laughs> well, it makes it harder, but you still did an excellent job. Yes. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty fly, you know, because that's kind of why I started tying it in the first place. It's you one to it be with a red throat. Sorry? Do you ever tie it with a red throat? No, I haven't. Oh. It's, um, it's just that that's the traditional black ghosts. But I mean, I don't see why one couldn't, you know, start bearing the colors. I've but, also put a hackle on the front of it. Yeah, possibly. Just to create a little more disturbance. Yeah, the only thing I don't like um, is with the synthetic uh, jungle cock, they, I find the colors not vibrant enough. Yeah. To really make the eye stand out like the real thing does. Yeah, I think that's the point of the jungle cock is that black in amongst the orange really it gives that eye of the fry, right? Right. Yeah. But I'm actually probably what, what I'll, I'll end up doing is getting a felt pen and an orange one and yeah. just make that orange a little brighter so that it sort of, um, Offsets the eye better. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't worry about the shake thing. <laughs> I I remember we had uh, Ted Leeson and and Jim Schollmeyer come up to the Edmonton one year for our, our seminars, and these guys are pretty famous. They they actually uh, have put this every technique you want to know about tying flies mm. book. It's about this thick. Uh, it, the Fly Tires Encyclopedia, I think it's called. Uh, and we watched uh, Jim Schulmeyer tie a size 18 and 20 fly, and he has a palsy not that, that his, both his hands shake like this all the time. And yeah. yet he could tie small flies like you wouldn't believe. So, <laughs> Well, that's what, you know, I, I struggle when I start getting into, you know, 16s, 18s, 20s. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But I imagine... Yeah, that, that's good. That's a that's a, a good pattern. I, I like that. Yeah. Dave, we must be the same age. I just got my COVID email ah. for my second shot. Yeah, so I've got to answer that now. What are you guys, 72? Yeah. I'm 75. 75. Yeah, I'm okay. 74. And, and they, I got mine this morning and uh, already booked mine for the 15th of June. I'm just about to book mine now. Yeah. So I'll wait a few more days, a couple more days here. Yeah. They'll send you an email if you're registered on the site. Yeah. So Dave, was that the earliest you could get yours or was that yep. just, it yeah, was, okay. Was yeah. So okay. I'm, I'm guessing they're running two to three weeks depending on how far they get to the, toward the age of 70. That's right, and okay. A little longer past that, I, I suspect for younger. Yeah. My wife is younger, so she'll have to wait another couple of weeks, I think. Okay. Yeah, mine too. There you go. <laughs> For some reason, this this resin that I bought takes a long. It you know most of them you fifteen seconds is good. I find you have to do this for like a full it's minute. That's because it's opaque. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the uh, this is the 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 pink. The pink version of the modeler I was doing last time. Yeah, that's 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 okay. what we. That's a gotcha. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I think Mohammed uh, suggested pink. So I tried different pink materials that I have. So these ones here on the left are deer hair. Nice. And this one I had some. I had bought some synthetic uh, fiber that's that's pink it's a little bit like fish hair maybe a little softer 
it comes out of South Africa. I can't remember what it's called. Um, mohair. No, it's not mohair. It's synthetic. It's a weird. Uh, it's it's a weird thing, but it's it's. I I think it must be a little bit similar to what um, what Dave was using for his. Uh, we 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 use we use two I, furs. We use two natural furs on on the the gotchas and the and the crazy charlies. Um, one was coyote, if you can find coyote fur, and the other was arctic fox. Yeah, except that I'd I'd have to uh, I'd have to dive into some some uh, some dyeing. Um, <laughs> we did it with because they, the the natural color of the coyotes. Yeah, there are lots of those around, and I think you can buy. You can buy a whole hide of uh, both coyote and, and fox. It's not that difficult yeah. to find. Cause, cause this is an experiment it's... here with, I don't know if you if you can see that the, the tip hackles are missing. Yeah. So these are, uh, you know, top quality um, hen hackles. I was, um, I was learning to tie some of these, um, you know, the uh, classic Adams fly. <laughs> which has hen hackle tips, right? And I, I never tied that fly because I always thought it's like, ah, it's a lot of fussing around with hackle tips and whatever. And I'm doing with uh, Steve and his son, where we're going through Charlie Craven's book. They want to learn to tie flies more seriously. Yeah. So uh, at some, we, we reached the point in the book where the next fly to learn is is the atoms, right? So I was trying to talk them out of it and they said, no, 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 we want to learn to tie the atoms. So, uh, well, what do I do? I bit the bullet, I took my hand hackles out and then I tied a few atoms and then I did it with them. And then I had these feathers left and I was like, I'm not throwing this stuff away. <laughs> I'm gonna tie some streamers. So this is the end result and um, I think these, um, you know, if you tie dry flies with, with uh, hand hackle tips, uh, these these grizzly feathers they look pretty cool. So I'm I'm itching, yeah. Yeah, I'm itching to try them out. Yeah, and I, I did a really ugly one with with a lot of pink inside. I'm not showing you that because it's like it's like a blob of pink with with two feathers on the side. But that's actually those top ones look like they'd catch uh, pinks. I, I think I think that we've got a pattern for Florent to do next week. I yeah. think so. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good. And I, I, want, can, I can do a gotcha or a crazy Charlie, which is the- I've, I've got something I want you to tie, Dave. What? But it's gonna take you time and you, you're gonna be bored doing it. Oh, oh for Davey McPhail's married wins. Forget <laughs> that, I, I'm, not <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I don't have oh my God. For that anymore. This was, so, this was so hard to yeah. do, and I didn't even do a great job. Oh. It, man. Those guys that do those married wings, they, they just, they're anal. <laughs> well, if you watch him tie it, he makes it look so easy. Oh, oh you mean you mean um, like Davy Wotan or, or just, just take your time, you know. Take your time. <laughs> Well, he does a lot of prep work too, you know, like, um, I don't know if Tony, if you watched, he has some videos about prepping feathers. Yeah. One of them, he takes the pheasant crests and he puts them in hot water. And then he takes, I don't know, basic tumbler glasses. Right. And he, he then lays out the the wet feathers that came out of the warm water he lays them out on these tumblers so that they curve nicely and they're not because some of the feathers as you get them off the from the package they right. they can be sort of twisting in all sorts of directions so he exactly. lays them out to dry for about a day on on the glasses and then he he pulls them off and they're like perfect curvature and everything right so yeah. I was thinking for your for your black ghosts, if you like, I know I've tried to tie with pheasant crest, and it's not an easy material to handle. And I was wondering mm -hmm. now if if it was because I wasn't 
you know, I had some of those twisty feathers. And, well, I uh, found from the, the, the crest, the real crest at the top, I found it had too much of a curve on it. So I switched to taking the ones just sort of from behind the eye. And right. but I think it is like two, you know, and, and they make a really nice tail, you know, when you just pinch the two, two feathers together. Yeah, really right. Nice, got a nice curvature as well. Well, Florian, my question is, did Davy McPhail tell you what model and size of tumbler he uses to get the right curvature. <laughs> just, just use your, uh, well, you can watch the video and then, um, you know, look look through your cupboard. Um, they, they look to me like pretty, pretty standard, you know, like I think we all have somewhere uh, different diameters of glasses. You know, if you want a, a, a smaller radius, so more curvature, I have some of those narrow beer glasses. Um, if you want a, a broader curvature, you know, like standard water glasses or, you know, whiskey tumblers, whatever. Single malt bottles. Yeah, bottles or dessert wine, uh, the dessert wine bottles, they're long and narrow to give you a small curvature. Standard wine bottles would give you a gentle curve because they're they're bigger radius. Um, if we're yeah. going to use if we're going to use glasses for uh, for fly tying, it should be these, which are single malt glasses. <laughs> yeah. Only we don't use them for tying. <laughs> That's right. We use them while we're tying. <laughs> Ty tying aids. <laughs> That's part of your uh, fly tying your equipment. Oh, that's, a, that's a different, yeah. It's not for for feather preparation. That that is when you're um, when you're getting the feathers on, you know, to sort of steady your nerves when you're marrying it's a them or something. A problem. Right? Exactly. <laughs> a friend a friend of mine in in Australia has has threatened to try and figure out how we can get together to do a virtual scotch tasting. The time time is is a little tricky, but I think I'll have a go with that. Well, as long as you're having the same uh, the same stuff to drink, it should be uh, it should it, be his collection, is, his collection is is not quite as good as mine, so we might have to do a little later. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if I start drinking that stuff, my shakes might go right. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good breakfast drink, right? <laughs> with oatmeal. It goes well with your oatmeal. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know what makes a nice, it's probably sacrilege to you Scotch people, but to have a um, vanilla ice cream and scotch liquidized is, is absolutely delicious. Well, just use the blended stuff, not the not the expensive yeah, stuff. Yeah, no, no, I wouldn't use expensive stuff. Just use, I don't know, Johnny Walker Red or something like that. Oh yeah. God! Famous grouse would do the trick. <laughs> yeah, my, anything. My daughter, my daughter's yeah, I mean, partner gave me this, which is uh, it's a Glenfiddich. It's called Fire and Cane. It's smoky whiskey finished in sweet rum casks. Very nice. Huh. They're doing wine now using whiskey barrels, um, old whiskey barrels, yeah. and they're fermenting the wine in the in the whiskey barrels. Apothic does it, I think. Yeah, but I find it. I don't like the flavor. No, it's it's like a, a lot of those scotches they do in a sherry cask for aging. Yeah. Yeah, they're not my favorite. You know which one is a nice um, a nice scotch that if you if I think if somebody gave that to you to drink and didn't tell you oh, we what lost. it is you put it. I'm trying to remember which one it they the ones they do in um there's one that's done in a sautern cask. Oh yeah, and it it's it's more like a it's more like a cognac than a scotch. I think it's a Macallan or something. Macallan, yeah. I'm not sure which which one it is. Uh, it's it's a, it's a very interesting one, and I I had a bottle of that, and I 
I gave it to a bunch of ladies who would normally not come anywhere close to scotch. And they were like, oh, this is a, is this scotch really? This is good stuff. Because <laughs> usually that, that, that oak, you know, not, not everybody likes to chew on oak. And, uh, you know, the, the really oaky things that some of us like, uh, well, those are not very popular. It's usually, right. I get comments along the lines of, what are you drinking there? You know, like from two meters away. Yeah, that lot, stuff stinks. A lot of those aged Scots are done in old bourbon barrels. Yeah, the bourbon would, would sweeten them up. But I think if you, if you go and do... If you do wine in, in scotch barrels, I think the issue is if you want any of the tannins and stuff, I think that the whiskey had already extracted all of that. Yeah. So I'm not sure what kind of flavors you're you're yeah. you're getting, well, you know. A friend, a friend of mine gave me a um, a 30-year-old rum and I didn't know what he was giving me. He said, just try this. And I said, it's cognac. He said, no, it isn't. It was 30 year old rum. I could not tell the difference so, between that and a, a, a good cognac. So where did he get that? Was it? I, it, I don't know where he is. It was Jamaican, yeah. but it was 30 year old. Was and, 30 years old aged in, yeah. uh, like was aged 30 years in, in wood or? In wood. In barrels. So it, was, it had spent 30 years in a barrel. Correct. Mm, okay. uh, it was so smooth I could because I'm not a rum drinker I'm not a big rum fan um, but it was it was delicious and it was I could not tell the difference and I've got a pretty educated palate when it comes to that stuff uh, yeah, I was shocked mm. but I stick to wine now basically that's it wine or, or occasional beer So what are we doing next week? Dave's doing Jamie, uh, Davy McPhail's. Um, no, no, <laughs> I, I, I'll see. I'll see if I can tie one of those EP shrimp up for you next week. Uh, I'll see what I've got. Okay. Yeah. But in, in either, in any way, we can we can work on like a gotcha as well. Give give that uh, Clouser revisit, but with a little bit different twist. Mm. You know what we haven't done for a heck of a long time? Um, you did went right in, at the beginning of COVID was um, <clears throat> a stone fly. Nymph. Yeah. Um, yeah stone flies oh. are good. Okay. This one is a little bit complicated. I don't know how well I can show it on the camera. I'd, I'd like to do this. Um, a woman body stone fly that I do in a couple of steps. Yeah, actually that, that would be interesting because do you use the overhand knot technique to eat or the... Or the... I, I, use the, I use the floss on bobbins to do yeah. the weave. Okay. Uh, and that's the only weave uh, I know how to do. And it's the only one that I can do to cut yeah, well, you could do that. That would be easy enough. Laws are in just my body, and that's that. And it's I can show you a finished fly. Uh, I Sweet have I should have some here. Just a sec. Let me uh, share screen. Oh yeah. I see Matt King has one posted today. Oh, can you see that? I, uh, no, I can't. I you have to move. Uh, and, uh... Oh my! I see my my camera software wasn't responding. I probably have to go back to it. Okay. Yeah, I think this is probably it. Okay, so here's here's one. 
Uh, where's the share screen here? Okay. That's kind of what they what they look like. Oh, they look buggy. Yeah, yeah. They, they, it's got um, it's got basically um, you know so the 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 standard um, the standard ingredient, so to speak, in some way, right? You've got uh, the bias for the tails. Then you've got the uh, woven body, which is a two-tone affair. It's brown or black on top and some kind of yellow on the belly. Um, and then it's got uh, seal fur for the thorax legs and everything else. And uh, a rib. To, to give the to give the segmentation look. What color is the biot? Brown? Uh, the biots are brown, yeah. Whatever shade of brown you have. Um, and you can you can also vary the colors on this, right? Obviously. Um, right. It's um, I don't know if I have some. This is a slightly darker shade of yellow. I've done some, I've done them with orange bodies as well slimmer, fatter, smaller. I usually do them in, in mostly 10s and 12s because stoneflies have a relatively long uh, life under life cycle underwater. So we, you're not already uh, the ones that are about to emerge. You're also fishing what's, what's there and is going to uh, emerge later. So, um, I, I do fish quite a bit of, you know, size 12s and stuff. So that's that's kind of what these guys look like. Yeah. And it's um it's it's a little bit of work that normally what I do is I um so I put on the tails, the beads and a bit of lead wire behind the bead. Okay. So I I prepare a bunch of hooks and then uh, once I prepare the hooks, then I get to the tying business itself, which is build the thorax. Um, so tie the rib on, weave the body, and then put the dubbing up front, which is pretty quick once you have the hooks prepared. Yeah. And I like to, to do the hook preparation beforehand so that I don't, uh, you know, it's just, um, it's easier to concentrate on making a smooth body and and everything. Yeah, that's that, that woven one with the two tone is like what we used to call a green Montana, right? Yep. Had a, had a, had a yellow underside. I saw there is. Uh, yeah, that's more like uh, the the abdomen is one color and the thorax is a contrasting, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to tie. I I, I agree. Well, we I, I did a couple of weaving te techniques some time back uh, with the one with the uses the overhand knot technique and then the one the alternating bodkins and then there's a uh, two ways of doing that. But uh, but yeah, I, I'd suggest you go ahead and do that that uh, woven stonefly and, and I'll pick something from the. I, the Clauser family, and uh, we'll do something like that. What happened to the Mickey Finn? Did you <laughs> <laughs> it would need considerably more scotch. <laughs> yeah. No, I gave up on married wings a long time ago. I have yeah. enough trouble just doing wet fly wings. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it another crack. Yeah, it's good. Getting them, getting the, <clears throat> getting them married at the right length so that everything lines up is just. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, so as you you got to get the right feathers. Um, I think that's the key is having the, the the right feathers with the right length and and that the barbules on the feather are the same. So the yeah, length exactly. of the barbs on the feathers have to be the same. Yeah, yeah. And um, gosh, but I mean, he's he's. When you look at him doing it, I mean, he's like separating one tiny piece, you know, as one of the colors. Yeah. So you've got a single strand of feather. 
Yeah, one. Uh, one. Only, you know, if you wanna if you wanna get there, you just go ahead by yourself. One thousand hooks. <laughs> that's that's step one. Uh, once you have the thousand hooks, you sit a device and you tie a thousand of those damn things, preferably about a hundred in each pattern. Right. And at the end of that, I'm pretty sure that you'll be feeling as confident as maybe yeah, not as they fail, but you, you'll be a, beginning to approximate that. Uh, I ever did that, I'd, I'd be past my due date. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it takes so darn long. Your best of already. Do that one I did took me probably 45 minutes. Ah, but, but that was your first one. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure, you can, I'm sure you can whittle it down to 4.5 minutes by the time you do a thousand. Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. So, yeah. Just, uh, uh, there's something to be said. Easier with time, you know. Something to be said for quick and dirty flies like a Griffith's gnat. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's you know, you know, you can tie Griffith's knots in sizes from size 20 all the way up to size six. Yeah. And they you work. What, I mean, it's consistently, quite honestly, I, I do find consistently that quite often, you know, very sparse, very just buggy looking flies that don't even have to be fancy, you know. I mean, the, we, these flies are more for fishermen than for yeah. fish, you know. Well, you know what? I tied a bunch of uh, flies that were, I think, about a size 14, maybe a 16, um, back in Ontario. Uh, just literally thin copper wire, uh, a glass bead head, and I caught lots of rainbows on that. And uh, it was uh, l literally like a one-minute fly. That's yeah. all it was. So... Yeah. And, I got to go. Uh, thanks, everybody. I'll okay. see you on Tuesday. Well, well, it's, it's, like the Griff, it's like the Griffith's gnat, which is, is basically a peacock curl body with one grizzly spiraled all the way up the body. It takes yep. the tie. Exactly. And, you know, you're fishing for trailing. It's the only fly you need. <laughs> yep. Um, well, but you know, the thing is, you, you kind of, I, I, I draw a distinction between flies I tie to get better at tying flies and that's a purpose in itself and then flies i tie just because i need a quick dozen to go fishing absolutely yeah you know? and the two are not there's sometimes they're overlapping and sometimes well you know you just like i don't think i ever fished an adams but okay you know if i had to learn to tie an adams i sat down and i I practiced yeah. and that had, uh, I don't well, know if I'll fish those flies, but. But you're, you're talking the traditional uh, upright wing cat skill patterns, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, 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 the thing where you want your wings to, to be nice upright and perfectly matched and splayed out beautifully and blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, yeah you know, I, I that's avoided. What that's what you're talking about, right? Yep. Yeah. Except, uh, except the wings are upright. Yeah. yeah the, the, the right wings up. on those things are supposed to be upright. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's like everything else. You just kind of sit down and do a little bit of, uh, of practicing. And, uh, yeah, it's, you know. Well, you can just get it more upright by a couple of wraps around the, uh, the quill. Yep. Yeah. And I just basically, I, it, it's the uh, the Charlie Craven book is a, is a paint by numbers uh, affair, and it, it it really works. I mean, I just followed the, his instructions to the letter, and I got a bunch of uh, here they are, and I think only one of them I had to take the I had to take the scissors to cut off. Oh. Uh, mind you, these are the big ones, right? So these are the the, the size. Uh, Whatever they are, these are these are tens, yeah. right? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of scissors, I bought a really nice pair from Robinsons this week. They're real 
nice. Um, you can adjust them as well with the screw on the side. Oh yeah, those are nice. They're really nice. Break the bank, but I mean, they're really, and they cut a super fine point. So if you're doing smaller flies and you want to trim stuff nice and tight. Those are like what, 40, the $40? 40 45 bucks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what they are these days. Um, so yeah, these are the, these are the Adamses and you know, it's, uh, it is actually nice. possible to tie the darn things. Nice job on those. Yeah, thanks. But like I said, um, if you guys wanna wanna work on more more complicated um, things, here's a yeah. This one I'm I'm quite happy that the wings came out all nice and in the right position. Mm -hmm. uh, Why don't that, you? That guy wrote a very good book for, you know, beginners in my, in my opinion. I just like, it's got every step is, is detailed and he doesn't shy away from, from giving you tips. He kind of knows where, where you're going to run into problems. Yeah. He's got, I think enough experience tying commercially and, and also uh, uh, teaching teaching fly tying. So that's that's why I, I, I use that. So I I learned to tie humpies last year. Uh, Dave suggested I, I do a humpy presentation. I never tied in my life. So I was like, yeah, okay. I did first Royal Wolves also from Craven's book. And yeah. that that got me to, to do uh, upright divided wings out of uh, calf body hair. And once I got that, figure it out then i could move on to doing uh to doing the humpy it, 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 it works so um yeah but anyway and with the leftover feathers boy you do you do nice little streamers <laughs> you know what i found uh for doing those add-ons it's it's an expensive fly because you you're basically using two complete grizzly hackles you know, yeah. to get matched wings. But but then you, if you go back, and you you keep those those hackles. And here's another tip. Um, I got some. I went and I bought some straws be, before they become illegal. Straws, right? Plastic straws, yeah, right. I mean, now there's the plastic straw police that's going to be after us. Right. But I. I'm a step ahead of them. I got a stash. Um, I cut these into small pieces. And when I do the atoms, right, you have to go through the trouble of pulling two hackles off the pelt from right. the same spot so they're nicely matched and everything, right? Mm -hmm. Well, look at your gray ghost. I mean, uh, your black ghost. You need ideally very well matched uh, feathers. And typically on a streamer, you, you want that, right? So the, the leftover, um, and I have them somewhere in a, in a bag, in a, in a Ziploc bag like this. So the leftover feathers, each pair goes inside a little piece of plastic straw. If I don't have time to tie the, the streamers right away. And That's they go in storage like this. And then once I have enough of these collected, I sit down and tie me a bunch of uh, a bunch of streamers, and this is handy when you prepare, right? I mean, I I never tie just one fly at a time. I tie like if I can, I do a dozen, right? right. So I prep. Now I'm going to be using this these little pieces of plastic straw to keep my uh, my matched feathers together. Laurent, I don't think the police will come after you. I think the fact that you're cutting them and using them and you will reuse them again, you're okay. Oh, I see. I, yeah, but you, you see how it is with these revolutionary uh, movements. They, they usually don't pay much attention to the sort of detail like you do. Yeah. They just go and say, plastic straw, off with his head. That's well, right. That's you know, that, that, that's how uh, this, this stuff usually works. You know. Yep. I've read and well, on one of us not to call it in. 
<laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if you're caught, you'll know who you'll know. It's someone from the. I, I know where it came from. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. It's like it's. It, well, obviously, it must be you guys in Victoria because that's the land of granola and and all of that, right? I'm I'm in Alberta, where you know plastic is good because it's made from oil. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> well, you know, you know, you can now buy paper straws and also uh, bamboo straws. I know, I know. But, you want reusable uh, ones, you can buy stainless steel and glass ones. Well, yes, you can. those are not as easy to cut, though, Dave. Yeah, they're no, not easy to cut, to cut, exactly. <laughs> i tell you what's, what, what's stupid, really, because <laughs> if you can straws, then you can go to your local florist, and every single flower on a long stem has a plastic straw on the end. Yeah, to hold the, the flower stem up, yep. I yep. see those, too. <laughs> and that's what I use for you know, storing the, um, my flash and so on. Yep. Oh, that's they a great, great idea. They work yeah. great. You just shove it out and cut off what you need. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. I like that. And um, I was going to buy some of those. Um, and then mm -hmm. the, the, the other thing to make Tony's thing work well is what you need is you need is zip ties, but you need the really narrow ones because you're, you're, materials don't always come right. right up with a good quality like the one you show there is the kind of you want and yeah. those are not easy to come by like your your local home depot is not going to have those you have to go to a like a i found them i haven't ordered them because it's like you have to order a big bunch and i'm yeah. waiting to put together a bigger order from an electronics supply um company they they they're called something else they call them mini zip ties or something yeah and there are the uh there are the yeah, narrow maybe six inches a narrow one the, yeah. six exactly inches. six inch and narrow that right. that's kind of what you want and if you want to buy those you have to do a little bit of um a little bit of searching well right. flora i had come across a company it may even be uline i'm not certain uh, that actually will will uh, manufacture custom zip ties. We can get them made with the club colors and the club logo on there, and we can get them your size, and we can get a batch of a thousand or five thousand or whatever. And I'm sure we can uh, we can split it up in the club. So, I got these from uh, Home Hardware. Oh, yeah. okay. Because I don't I, have I, much Home <clears throat> Hardware around and, here. And these I just went down to my local florist when I was buying my brides some flowers. And I said, I need 20 of these. And he charged me 10 cents a piece. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's the, it's the zip ties that are, that are the hard ones. So yeah, if you have the, them at home hardware, that's perfect. We'll, we'll get you a batch, Flora. I've got a home hardware. I'm going to it just now before I go and do some other work. Yeah, six inch thin. Yeah, the, 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 the thin ones. Yeah, I, I looked around here and it's like, nah, the, the usual suspects don't don't have them in. No, Alberta only makes big size ones because they use more oil to produce that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's that sort of Texas idea. You know, everything is bigger. Yeah, that's right. I know. I yeah. know. Anyways, gents, I have to get going. Have a great yes. week. And we'll uh, catch yeah, up. You, you too. Soon. So, uh, woven stonefly for me, and Dave is going to do married wings, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Reluctantly. I'm going to do a shrimp or a gotcha. One of the two. I have to figure out what I got for materials. Okay, gents. Bye bye. Okay, good. Now so, I get to go and put a new roof on my smoker. <laughs> you're almost there, right? Yeah. So, I've all, all painted up and everything. I just have to take the old one off and put the hinges on the new one. That's my job for today. I have to sort my flies. I we should have I mean, a little round table about about how do you contain or sort your uh, your flies. I, I may take a, an, an hour or so uh, shortly. At noon today is the uh, Euro final. Oh, Chelsea and um, yep, Chelsea and, and Man City. Man City. Yeah. Speak, speaking of that, is the um, is that European um, whatever Champions. thing the Euro soccer thing? Yes, yeah, I was talking about. Happens every big year. final today. 
No, no, no. But that's um, that's that's part of the um, UEFA whatever stuff. But the the other one where they have the the, the country teams. I don't know what it's called, the European Championship thing. Oh, that's that's Euro. That's that's been postponed because of COVID. It's postponed to 22. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because it was, I think it was supposed to happen last year, and obviously it, it got cancelled. And I wasn't sure if they were doing that this year or. Don't don't believe so. 22. That's in 22 then. I think so. Yeah. Oh, by the way, James, if you're interested, there is a huge mayfly hatch happening uh, at Goldstream. So yes, I'm sir. assuming Langford Lake would be, um, you know, probably taking uh, mayflies right now. Mm. Yeah. Sounds good. I'll probably go pike fishing if I get the chance to get out at all. I had some, I had some good fishing last week. Mm. On, uh, I could do some some pike streamers. I mean, they're just kind of simple streamers that yeah. use unconventional materials. I have some old um, anything that's gaudy and makes a lot of noise. <laughs> no, 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 no. It has to be gaudy in a certain way. I had tremendous success with something made out of a Chinese feather duster that has kind of grizzly brown hackles on it and then a bit of uh you know just a touch of sparkle there to get the uh the thing looking more interesting anyway i'm gonna stop things off Gents, thank you very much and we will okay. see you next week see you next time Bye -bye.